the perihelion precession of Mercury's orbit, the deflection of light by the Sun, and the gravitational redshift of light are tests proposed by Albert Einstein to prove his general theory of relativity, the current understanding of gravity in the universe. Now most people know who Einstein was. I mean, his name is practically synonymous with genius. And I'd say many people have heard the term general relativity. But the story behind how the theory was first confirmed is fascinating. And a great little history nugget with a wide cast of characters. If Einstein is here, then I'm all the way over here on the intelligence scale. So I won't pretend to understand the complex math and physics behind the theory, but rather provide a general gist behind modern physics' current description of gravitation. In Newton's law of universal gravitation, he states that every particle attracts every other particle in the universe with a force directly proportional to the product of their two masses, gravity. How that force comes about? No one knows. Not even Newton. Along with his laws of motion, Universal Gravitation was published by Newton in his Philosophia Naturalis Principia Mathematica, more commonly known as the Principia, in 1687. For over 200 years, Newton's law of universal gravitation stood as the model for gravity, the explanation for the movement of heavenly bodies and why things fell. But in the early 20th century, things began to change. Up until the late 19th century, it was thought that the region between celestial bodies was filled with a substance known as ether, through which light traveled and gravity attracted. Einstein saw it differently. He saw gravity not as an unseen force, but rather matter distorting what's known as space-time. This space-time is what replaced aether theory. This distortion, this curvature, is what we know as gravity. Matter, following a straight path, if trapped by a gravitational field, will now follow a new straight path along the curved space-time. Keep in mind that this curvature happens in all three dimensions of space and in time. So you remember the three classical tests of general relativity, the perihelion precession of Mercury, the deflection of light by the Sun, and the gravitational redshift of light. Of these three, the deflection of light by the sun is the focus of our story and the experiment that shot Einstein and his theory into the limelight. This is the sun. The earth is over there by its lonesome. Now, remember that space-time is being curved everywhere, not just on this plane. Gravitational lensing, the scientific term for the deflection of light, is the phenomena whereby light rays are bent by gravitational fields, curved space-time. So when viewed from Earth, a star in position A appears to be in position B. Any sufficiently dense body, the Sun in this case, curves space-time. An incoming light ray is then distorted by the gravitational field, making it appear that the light came from position B, rather than its true position, position A. However, this isn't a new idea. Newton himself even begged the question, in 1704, albeit not as sophisticated. It wasn't until a 1911 paper when Einstein proposed calculations on the amount of bending light undergoes, roughly 0.8 seconds of arc. To picture this, imagine looking at the moon from Earth and dividing it into 1,800 equals livers. One's liver is one arc second. A little under one's liver would be the amount of deflection observed. In regards to testing his calculations, Einstein wrote, as the fixed stars in the parts of the sky near the sun are visible during total eclipses of the sun, this consequence of the theory may be compared with experimental evidence. It would be urgently wished that astronomers take up the question here raised, for apart from any theory, there is the question whether it is possible with the equipment at present available to detect an influence of gravitational fields on the propagation of light. On May 29, 1919, with a solar eclipse imminent, two teams, one led by Arthur Eddington 
on the island of Príncipe, off the coast of West Africa, and the other in Sobrao, northern Brazil, led by Andrew Cromelin, prepare to photograph star positions, which will be visible during totality. But getting to these sites wasn't so easy. With a few failed expeditions in 1912, 1914, and 1918, the stakes were high for the 1919 expeditions. Even more so when Einstein realized that his original 1911 calculations for the bending of light were incorrect. All expeditions prior to Einstein's release of the general theory of relativity in 1915 were riding on that 1911 0.8 arc seconds of deflection, which was roughly the amount reached just using Newtonian gravitation. The new calculation gave an amount of approximately 1.8 arc seconds, nearly double the earlier amount. Imagine just under two moons livers. With the new calculations in hand, and the general theory of relativity published, it was now a matter of getting the papers out of Germany and in the hands of the wider scientific community. There was just only one problem. Though in its infancy, World War I was raging on in 1915, and history would have it that Einstein, a German, and the expeditionary teams, composed of Brits, were on opposite sides of the trenches. Communication between them was severed by their respective countries' animosity towards each other. Our cast of characters is about to get bigger. Enter Willem de Sitter, an astronomer from Neutral Holland, and English astronomer Frank Dyson. Because of his neutral status, de Sitter received copies of Einstein's paper in 1916 and quickly passed them over to Eddington who, in turn, began promoting the theory and the need to test it via the bending of light. The at the time astronomer royal, Frank Dyson, realized that the May 29, 1919 eclipse would be perfect to test the theory against, as the path of totality would happen in front of the Hades star cluster, a collection of some of the brightest stars that can be seen with the naked eye, perfect for measurement. But the meat grinder that was World War I still had something to say. In 1917, at the age of 34, Arthur Eddington was eligible for the draft, and with the attrition of trench warfare raging on, the British armed forces was in desperate need of bodies. But here's the thing, Eddington was a Quaker, and he made it known that he would be a conscientious objector, something which of course didn't fare too well with military command. That was until the Astronomer Royal came to the rescue. Dyson, like Eddington, knew the importance of testing the bending of light to confirm Einstein's theory. He petitioned, along with other academics, on Eddington's behalf, that it would be in the best interest of England for Eddington to embark on the expedition first, then, if the war wasn't yet over, to serve in the armed forces. This compromise was reached, and the expedition was a go. Eddington writes, the rain stopped about noon, and about 1.30, we began to get a glimpse of the sun. We had to carry out our photographs in faith. I did not see the eclipse, being too busy changing plates, except for one glance, to make sure that it had begun, and another halfway through to see how much cloud there was. We took 16 photographs. They are all good of the sun, showing a very remarkable prominence but the cloud has interfered with the star images. The last few photographs show a few images, which I hope will give us what we need. After years in the making, the photographs were finally taken. The theory's fate was at hand. In November 1919, the results were shared at a joint meeting between the Royal Astronomical Society and the Royal Society of London. The Sobral team measured seven stars in good visibility at a deflection of 1.98 plus or minus 0.16 arc seconds. The Princip team measured five stars in subpar conditions at a deflection of 1.61 plus or minus 0.40 arc seconds. Both results were within two standard errors of Einstein's value and more than two standard errors from the Newtonian value. Einstein was correct. 
Einstein's theory of general relativity, though deliberated for some time, was eventually accepted, and Albert Einstein became a household name. This is an Einstein ring, a result of extreme gravitational lensing. The blue horseshoe is actually light from a galaxy further behind the yellow center galaxy, which acts as a lens. Though we have thousands of photos from deep space, this phenomena is only possible when the ring source, the lens, and the observer are aligned. Such a beautiful phenomena, at the sake of seemingly random, spectacularly vast, cosmic alignments. I can't help but think of how amazing it is, how unlikely it is for us to live on a planet that can experience that, and much less a solar eclipse. But everything that has to fall in place so that the moon can cross paths with the sun just right to produce one of nature's most magnificent events. All the factors, the moon's size, the sun's size, their distance from each other and from the earth, the fact that the moon and earth orbits are the way they are, whether or not stars fall in alignment with totality, and, of course, the fact that intelligent life even exists and exists on this planet and all the hurdles and technological evolutions needed to be able to see gravity by the light bending around it. The fact that gravity is the curvature of space-time by matter, I can't help but think of it as the hand of God. Holding a star in the palm of his hands, the depression the star would cause, allowing for a planet to orbit round. Yet his hands envelop the star and provide a cosmic mosaic of galaxies and black holes, other stars and planets, stretching further and longer than one could ever imagine. Hey! Hey, Isaac! Yes? Ezington and the boys just got back. And we need to let the world know I was right. <coughs> we, we were right. In that case, why don't you get yourself a website? A domain on Squarespace is easy to set up. Squarespace time? What? What? Well, it seems like you're going to need some help. With Squarespace's all-in-one platform, they've got you covered. With dozens of award-winning templates, you can be sure to find something to get you started. And with 24-7 customer service, if you get lost in the gravity of the situation, Squarespace staff is there to help. This is good and all, but this recent expedition has left the wallet, uh, slim. Uh, not if you use code DISRUPT to get 10% off your first purchase. Fascinating. Hey, do you guys know why we're spinning? <laughs>